Welcome, dear readers, to Cover My Ass, where baffling books are reviewed but not read by yours truly. My name is Kaki. And I'm Kay. And remember, we only judge a book by its cover. So if you have no idea what's going on, don't worry, it'll pass. Speaking of passing, uh, Kaki, would you come and uh, wander up along with me, oh, please? Oh, uh, that's unusual. Yeah, uh, yes, yes, okay. Uh, we're heading up to the uh, the first floor today. For our American readers at home, that's the second floor. Oh, stairs. Yes. Oh, I've got to say, Kay, I'm a little bit intimidated by what? this because I've been I've been exploring mostly like the two dimensional space of the of the ground, and then I've gone I've gone up along the bookshelves, but yeah. like these stairs, I've seen them shimmering on the horizon. Oh, they're I've, I've l- never I've they're, never dared to. They're left behind the grimoire cage, so yeah. is it safe? Oh yeah, totally. Okay, well, you 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 lead the way, and I'll, I'll follow yeah, you. Just, I've, I've got to say, I'm just uh, I'm just a little okay. bit I'm just a little oh, bit no, skittish don't, about don't it. Don't worry about it. Like okay. we're just we're just going to a different floor of the library. Oh, this uh, is exciting. Yes, yeah, so, I mean we've been doing this for uh, quite a while now, and I think you've proven yourself um, well uh, established in the in the routines of the library. And I think it's time to oh, uh, wow. um, go to the more advanced books. <gasps> this is amazing. So I'm I'm literally moving up in the world. You are, yes. Well, in fact, oh yes, I hadn't, yeah. even, I hadn't even considered that. But well, yes, we are. Uh, you there are moving are up. A lot of stairs. We are going to the. Uh, uh, yeah, just, it's it's a bit of a walk. I can barely see the floor anymore. Uh, yeah, are we still going up? Just look at the stairs. Yes, we're going okay, up. Just I mean, like on the stair. we're, we're not, it's not far. It's just, just just a little bit longer, and we'll be up in the first it's floor. Is the air getting thin up here? Oh, well. Strictly speaking, yes, but it probably shouldn't be that noticeable yet. Okay, okay. Uh, just through this door here, and we are on the uh, on the library. It's, it's, it looks almost the same as the ground floor. Yeah, astonishingly the same. Yeah, it's just that the books are slightly different here. Uh, we've got a slightly different cataloging system. Oh, yeah, they've got different runes on the Dewey Imperial system. Yes. Uh, so the problem here is that the books here are a little bit more advanced. Now, ad- advanced in what way? Like Like older readers for older readers with, with yeah. bigger words? Is that what no, you mean? no, no. It's more that the books here have a bit of a will of their own. Oh. Reading the books here can influence reality. Can influence... Okay, but you say that so casually, as if that's a normal thing for libraries. Is it a normal thing for libraries? Because I haven't been to yeah, one in a while. It is for my library. Okay. The problem here is, like, well, for once I think you're ready for these kind of books, and we'll, we'll, see, we'll, we'll see about that, because unbeknownst to you, this week's book that we are reviewing is from this floor. Uh, oh, so wow. I, uh, yeah, you might, I guess you didn't notice the difference in the, no, in the I guess number maybe notation that, system. Maybe that means that, that I am ready for it. Maybe that means that yes, I just didn't very really true. pay attention. However, the problem here is the books keep rearranging themselves, so it'll be your task to make sure that everything gets properly arranged and catalogued. Question? Yes? My usual standard for keeping things organized is, I would say, chaotic good. Yes. So, best effort. That's probably going to work very well in this with the books here. Yeah? It's, okay. It, it's, so it's the, more like a... That's a decent library ar- alignment. I was going to say, it's going to be more like a, a coercion effort than a pick them up and stack them in the right spots, because that's not oh. going to work. Well, I have some experience with that, with the the, the erstwhile uh, hebdomadary dude ranch that I exactly. planted. And Labrorium, I mean, that would not fly here. I mean, it didn't right, fly. It, 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 Labrorium didn't fly downstairs either, t- but... Well, technically, it's quite successful for the uh, three raccoons in a trench coat that are oh, currently right, the yes. mayor of the book fort that I built. But they're, into a they're not flying. No, and, that's true. And okay, here, so the know, books here are going to fly. It could. I mean, okay, like so I said, I they have a habit. A of, they, have, they have a habit of moving around when you're not watching them. So how how did you handle this in the past? Do you watch them all the time, or do you just sort of sort of adapt? I, I, I made sure that there was a junior library or sorry, a, a librarian here who was <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it, it sounds like this is one of those jobs that you've maybe always delegated. Is that is that whenever I can? It's like not? it might have been neglected for the past eighty seven weeks. But then I have one more question. Yeah. Which costume slash armor would you recommend for this job? Now you've seen some of my uh, my, my my various outfits, okay. my my little uh, tweed romper and my little pith helmet uh, and the uh, pro or anti bear suit. Yes. Um, well, I would think pro or anti bear suit, but more really that dangerous. Oh no 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 no! I'm just uh, thinking aesthetic. I would if I were you, oh. I would uh, go think cardboard samurai. That would probably we work very well. <sighs> Yes, yes. Oh, this is going to be glorious. Yes, I'll be the oh, I'll be the I'll be the level 1. Can we call it that? The first floor. Can we sure. call it level 1? Yeah, there we go. Cardboard samurai. Oof. Oof. I mean, it's a lot of responsibility that you're entrusting me with. Like I feel I, well, I feel I, th- I, feel I think really... you've proven yourself uh, so you. far. So, yes, don't get disoriented. If you wake up tomorrow and you think that you're still on the ground floor, you're not. It might look the same. It's very similar. Okay, so how can I be sure? I mean, if it if if, if this is one of those rascally rivalry floors that yeah. likes to warp one sense of reality, which it mm-hmm. sounds like it is. Uh, yeah, well, how you're, can not I, sleep, you're not a sleepwalker, are you? Do sleepwalkers generally know that? Ooh, it's generally other people tell them that they. I mean, 
Yeah, and, and the only other person I've met in like eighty nine weeks is you, and only when you descend from the sky for the actual recordings, and then and then not a lot of time this, in between. Yeah, okay. Well, don't worry about it. Like uh, you can check the system, and also you know if the books stay in place too much, then you're probably back on the ground floor. But unless you actually go descend a long uh, staircase... Yeah, it is quite a while. I mean, it it's is. giving me vertigo. Just, I mean, looking down at it is way more intimidating than looking yeah, up. Just I guess it's a just straight don't, ladder. Just don't do that. Uh, no, I mean, okay. I, we can put a few stacks in front of it if you don't want to... Uh, yeah, no, I think that'd be good. That sounds like a very good that'd idea. That'd be good. Ooh, uh, there seems to look like... Ooh, there's sort of a... Um, a sort of a fuzzy static field around these stacks, like like oh, oh. when you when you bring your fingers a little closer to them. Oh yes, it's like it's, little sparkles it's between the, it's your the little uh, yeah, kind of like you're trying to push two magnets together yeah. with the same polar polarity. Oh, this is exciting! That kind of feeling, yeah, you can just have to grab them firmly and it'll be fine. That's what I always say. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it goes double for books. So so yeah, grab them with both hands and just and just go for it as we did this week because yeah, I thought this was quite a special book. It was. It is like I said, it's from this floor. So I brought it down for you too, so you could read it over the past week, and then we can now oh, do a review. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Like, so the, fact that, the fact that you're still here like, is also very promising that it's uh, not <laughs> oh, going dear. to... Uh, it might have even behaved if it stayed in one place. And you never noticed that it like was on the diff- other uh, other side of where you of you when you woke up? You know, it's just a fragment of haze, haze of confusion anyway. Whenever whenever there's nobody around, like time just ceases to mean anything. Space is uh, is optional. So I just take things as they as they go. I mean, I'm used to things being in other places because if it's not the the bookworms or the raccoons or the velociraptors uh, formerly fair, moving fair, things around, fair point. So uh, I think I'll adapt to this weirdness quite well. I tell you what, I am committed to succeeding brilliantly. That sounds like a f- and very good thing. I'll note I that in your performance review that, that, is, that, that is your commitment and that that's how you're going to go ahead with this uh, new project. Hell yes. Sounds fantastic. Speaking of the Library Raptors, I think we're going to see a few of those in, in this week's book, aren't we? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I was... Oh, my my heart was uh, swole at the at the at the sight of all these these dinosaurs on the cover, and mm. reminded me of uh, uh, the friends that I made among the uh, among the velociraptors that uh, that formerly inhabited the, uh, the the ground floor of your library. Right when they weren't biting you, mm, you know they've got one utensil. True. Well, they have that little cute little four paws, don't they? Yeah, it's it, it's not much. It's adorable, but it's uh, it's not much. Which is one of the plot points in uh, in this week's book. Isn't ah, it? yes. So by Eric Flint and Reich E. Spore, I suppose. Reich, Rick, Rick, R Y K, Rick, R Y K. No, I like that. Ricky Spore. Um, that seems to make sense. <laughs> Ricky Spore and Eric Flint. He's a veteran. Yes, we've had him several times in the past. We certainly have, uh, and 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 not through any any effort, but he just seems to pop up from time to time. Yeah, on a lot of baffling books. As one does. I mean, it is a very baffling cover. I mean, the book's called Boundary, uh, and we have a number of dinosaurs around a crashed spaceship. Yes, and if you look down at your podcasting device, you should should be seeing the cover of today's book, and if not, you can check the show notes for an image and a link at Cover My Arsecast on Twitter or CoverMyArsecast.com, where you'll find episode 89, Boundary by Eric Flint and Ricky Spohr. And yeah, there's... Oh, I always love it when I can say this. There's a lot going on on this cover. There is. There is. We have three different kinds of dinosaurs. Yeah, there's trikes in the background. Yeah, oh, and is the, it triceratops? Yeah, I think they're triceratops. Uh, no, actually, they've only got two horns, but it looks Yeah, like. right. Yeah, so... Biceratopses. The, bice- oh, yeah. Uh, and then there's like a... I don't know. Is it a T-Rex? I don't know. It has a fairly narrow muzzle, so it's probably not yeah, a T-Rex. Yeah, and a big crest. There's maybe Allosaurus, I, um, Megasaurus. Ankylosaurus. Uh, oh, No. Erectopus. Erectopus. Oh, there we yes. go. I remember that from my notes now. Oh, very good. Uh, and uh, the spaceship, uh, which is a crashed... I don't know, it's a fighter. I see a machine gun there uh, in the foreground. Yeah, it's, got, it's got lovely, like, curly cues on the side. Yes. All these, the, all these lovely engravings. The, yeah, the signals, and I assume those are for temporal systems. Yes, because it's not just a spaceship. It's a time ship. Like, I love these high-concept books that, that, that just go all over the place and really push the boundaries, A, eh, uh, oh, of the imagination. Yes. Yeah. Spaceship crashed on dinosaur planet, or actually crashed on Earth when during the yes, time of the Yes, during the, the Cretaceous era, the, yes. the, the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Yes, the book opens with a couple of uh, B- Barbara and uh, John Mendelssohn. Uh, <laughs> yes. Who are described as a pair of chrono gorillas. Chrono Gorillas, yes, yes, yes. That I was, I was just immediately captivated by this idea that there's some kind of time conflict. Exactly, and they are on a course around Earth, do a little bit of plotting and home in on the 
big space rock which is approaching Earth. Yes, the uh, the legendary asteroid responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Now, where did that land again? Like, is that is that the one that hypothesized to be the the, the big crater in Mexico? You mean the entire Gulf of Mexico, basically? Oh yeah, that's the one, the Gulf of Mexico. So they basically used their little ship to dislodge the flight path of the asteroid. Yeah, uh, they dis- divert it, uh, put a little bit of light pressure against it, and just you know, it just needs a little bit. If you get there early enough, you only give it a small push to uh, get it to miss Earth. Oh yeah, I mean if it's far enough away, then a few degrees makes all the difference. Exactly. However, in doing so, they doomed themselves. Yeah, they ran into some unspecified trouble, didn't they? In fact, when they were only trying to. Um, divert the asteroid and uh, therefore uh, prevent the uh, extinction level event that wiped out the dinosaurs. Yeah. They didn't manage that, but they crashed on Earth. Uh, And I think that's what we're seeing now, which is the dinosaurs investigating the crash site. Yes. It's at this point that we learn some more about dinosaurs in this era of uh, of the Earth. And that's going to kind of be the, the theme of this book as we follow history proceeding from this this moment of divergence where yep. the extinguishing asteroid fails to hit uh, uh, hit Earth, Earth and then seeing what happened and we learn more about these uh, these dinosaurs that are far more advanced than the simple animals that we imagine them to be in popular imagination vastly more cultured and vastly more yeah. um, evo- evolved i suppose than we think the plan was to get the uh, asteroid out of the way and then let nature take its course and do their thing but of course in crashing the ship they gave the uh, dinosaurs a little bit of extra to uh, to work with. Yes, which which initially seems like it, it's it's going to have a, a a wonderful wonderful result because these dinosaurs are remarkably peaceful, living together in harmonious communes, mm-hmm. and even like. We know that there are predators, right? And we know that there are herbivore dinosaurs, and you would imagine that they would be at each other's throats. Yeah. Um, but but no, we discover that none of their predation is aimed at other dinosaurs because mm. they're already practicing mammal husbandry. Oh, yes. They're like uh, feeding the little rodents and stuff, which are... Uh, exactly. Keeping like them, herding uh, the little primates into yeah. pens and, uh, uh, and seeding the right kind of trees where they yeah. like to hang out and, and then devouring them by the bushel. Thing. And some of the, uh, the dinosaurs are adamantly vegan and uh, yeah but even they do appreciate the, the the value of some of the animal husbandry because the the primates oh the primates they've got these clever things they've got these clever things called hands yeah. uh, that the dinosaurs famously lack they're well, not some very good yeah, with them. Okay, yeah, but got, they're little grabbers and they're, they're yeah, not really and unfortunately the space claw hadn't been invented yet right so they're kind of dependent on manual labor ah manual labor but, Manus means hand. There's oh. already a joke in there. Oh. But no, yes, Man- yes, that's right. I must have misread it. I must have misread it. Manual labor. <laughs> and they're using the primates and the little monkeys and the whatnots to do housekeeping tasks. And they find the wreckage of the of the ship and then they notice the two, uh, the couple of uh, chrono gorillas, uh, their, their bodies, and they realize, like, oh, this is something weird. Like, they look just like the primates, but they're... And they have more even involved. cleverer hands. And look at what they're making. And they have no idea where it came from, of course. They, yeah. They, saw this two ships streaking down and it's, it's in remarkable good shape considering the fact that it crash landed barbara and john have the good fortune to to meet first uh, uh i mean honestly rather a cute little dinosaur called a, a bambi raptor yeah which is a real thing okay like i i really liked how throughout most of this book and many of the chapters all the all the dinosaur names that i encountered while they were fucking weird yeah. actually were real dinosaur names yeah. well i mean it's a good thing that about 150 years ago when dinosaurs started uh, getting discovered all the scientists and stuff were like like hardcore into Latin and stuff like that and giving them all yes. Latin names because otherwise if it happened these days these things would be like called a, like a Heckenchonkosaurus or something. Right? <laughs> yeah. Now we have all these fancy Latin names or, or named after the uh, location where they were found like the, the Utah Raptor that springs to mind for me. Yeah, and the uh, there's a few that I happen to know off the top of my head. I don't I didn't even have notes from them. Uh-huh. The the Avalancherus, let me see, Avalancherus Stari, the Avalancherus Lenoni, Avalancherus Simoni, and Avalancherus Garfunkeli. Oh, how does that work? It's like, the, I mean, I guess if you discover one, you get to name it. But correct, correct, and and like this person also named a, a, a whole series of other dinosaurs after the members of, I think, the Sex Pistols. Yes. Okay. Uh, 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 Viciousy Roteni. Um, and the other sex pistols that I don't know. I'm amazed if you even know one of them. Of I, I, I Sid Vicious. 
I have no Johnny well, Rotten? I recognize the name, but I wouldn't have if, if you'd put me on the spot, I wouldn't have been able to. Uh, Speaking of putting on the spot, if you had to name a dinosaur, what would you name it? Oh, um, I would call, depends on what kind of dinosaur it is. Big one. A big one. Okay, I would probably call it a, well, I, I can't say heckin' Chunkosaurus now, but that's already Yeah, done that one. Yeah, done that one. <laughs> Damn, shot my powder too early. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would call it a Librosaurus. Uh, the Librosaurus, <laughs> yeah. I was going to go for Potentiosaurus, but... Oh, okay. No, no, I think a Librosaurus <laughs> Probably be the best one here. I mean, it's certainly better than the fucking Gasosaurus, which is the second dinosaur that they meet. Which uh, yeah, is unfortunate flatulence. Uh, first contact goes not go very well between these uh, it's between these one of those species. Herbivores. I mean, it's like have you ever seen a hippo fart? I'm alive, aren't I? So no. <laughs> I, oh, I mean, not not in person. <laughs> oh, 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 well, still no. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, it's, because I'm it's, sane, aren't I? It's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, first contact. I mean, they're they're shocked, of course, that they find themselves in a situation where they didn't mean to be, and they realize that yeah. not are, not only are they changing history as they planned to, they're also like like influence it themselves now, I suppose. Not only did they discover that history is quite different than they imagined, but they're now also responsible for uh, for changing it even more. Right, and unfortunately, they, as, as proper chrono guerrillas, they can justify it to themselves that it's like it was meant to be, or that's like it's just right. And yes, like, yes, exactly, exactly. I'm only fulfilling my own destiny. Exactly, in, and... Y- the fact that we're just like, we're only going to move the uh, asteroid out of the way, but now we're contaminating history rather than just changing it. It's a bit of a weird argument, but I mean, whatever it takes. I mean, they don't really have a choice. I mean, their their craft is largely destroyed, at least yeah. the, the go parts for the temporal engine. The, the beautifully crafted sigils that we see on the cover. They yeah. are gorgeous, aren't they? It is. It's, uh... So at this point, I was very curious to see how this how this world would develop mm. how these 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 changes how the like continued existence of dinosaurs and the influx of uh, 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 some more advanced technologies would influence how the world looks in the in the future and was delighted to see that that's that's actually the structure of this book yes i mean this is just the first few chapters like the first one is the, a little bit of space opera and moving the asteroid and there's the, the crash and the first contact with the with the dinosaurs but then soon enough the, the book takes a huge leap in time and the the metal are no longer uh, alive when it jumps to uh, the proceedings of Allosaurus the Great, who is busy, uh, <laughs> yes. busy conquering uh, conquering the planet uh, yes, with his war right. uh, soldiers, uh, <laughs> yes. both dinosaur and um, a mammalian. Yes, uh, a mammalian, a primate slave army. Uh, uh, because in our in our history, Alexander the Great was famous for integrating the the, the conquered into his army. Yes, he would defeat a region and would integrate the local like marry into the local aristocracy, promote the local uh, 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 generals, much to the displeasure of his own army, of course, who were used to the pillaging and and looting. Yes. Allosaurus the Great was so successful because he made use of all the resources available to him. Uh, Some would say he's somewhat progressive. I think then they had have to keep the army moving. They couldn't, like, stop because then it would be to, uh, it it would, like, deplete the uh, the resources. Yes, yes, yes. It had to keep uh, keep moving. I mean, it wasn't as crazy as uh, uh, Xerxes the Great, mm. later uh, uh, famous from, uh, I mean, now the the, the movie Three Hundred. But uh, yes, that was uh, that was an army of six million where dozens of people would would die by lightning strike each night because that's just statistically uh, what happens that, when you have that many people you- camping about in the fields. And yes, oh, I guess so. Now, what I liked was, I mean. Obviously, so we look at our, our, our own history. What are the major differences between this and uh, that history? Dinosaurs, right? Yeah. But there's there's also this through line of something that we saw uh, uh, very early on. These communes where uh, uh, the the former time uh, chronogorias uh, were adopted into mm-hmm. were all based around sun worship, which makes sense for. A lot of these, a lot of these dinosaurs were cold blooded, yeah. so they'd need to spend a lot of time basking in the sun. Their bodies required the heat from the sun in order to be, to be able to function. Yeah, uh, something that is still the case in Allosaurus the Great's uh, uh, time, time. Yeah, where every morning's battle is preceded by just hours of sunning themselves before their muscles work and they can. And d- uh, during which time the mammals are just like busy keeping the camp running, keeping everything tidy, yeah. p- polishing the scales, w- washing the armor, making sure that everybody is. Uh, 
up and ready to go as soon as they warm up enough. Because that was the major advantage of the of the European cultures in this case. They'd they they'd made much better use of their of their manual labor. Ah. So I thought it was very telling that uh, uh, Eric Flint and uh, and Ricky Spohr chose this era. Uh, obviously, it's sixty five million years after the after the previous event, and 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 then they speed through the next centuries. Well, because after uh, uh, Allosaurus the Great, you also have the science of Plesiagoras. Yes, and the the military brilliance of Julius Caesar. Oh yeah, he was like shortly followed in the era by uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Janeshida of Nazareth. <laughs> Janeshida. Gen- 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 Genesia of Genesia Nazareth. Of Nazareth. Yeah, yes, he was like a very, right. very famous dinosaur. That's right. That's like one right. of the one of the great religious founders, like the Shin of Anatra Buddha, uh, who was also. Uh, <laughs> a- <laughs> yes. Uh, it was one of those duck-footed uh, dinosaurs that uh, that Genesia, like he was actually, if he run, got a got a good run up, he could actually run over water. Oh, that's that's amazing. Yeah, things. right. Like, I, mean, I mean, everybody yeah. thought so at the time. I guess if you have like your your toes splay out wide enough, and you've got those flippers, those uh, webbings between them. Yep. Then uh, yeah, with a good run up, I mean, it's like it's it's how legends start. Yeah, certainly yeah. in this case, I mean, everybody thought it was miraculous because they'd never seen a Puebasaur before. A Puebasaur. Uh, Quebasaur. Okay. So it's I, the N Q W E B, and that's uh, the the N part is just the, and then you go into the Queba. Quebasaur. Quebasaur. Okay. Yeah. It's like I thought it was a quirky sword, but uh, but <laughs> <laughs> close <laughs> enough. Yes. Uh, 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 leading up to the building of uh, Hadrosaur's Wall. Ah, uh, yes. Between uh, what we know as England and Scotland. Right, but uh, after that, uh, there was like uh, Emperor uh, Neovenator. Who was uh, who watched uh, who watched Rome burn? Oh, <laughs> yeah. And while he while he fiddled, uh, supposedly, and eventually died, uh, saying that like I apparently I have neither friends nor enemies. The imagery of Neo Venator burning Rome is is, yeah. is rather famous. Didn't he at one point marry a horse? And speaking of, uh, no, I think he made a horse a senator. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, speaking of mammal husbandry. Oh yes, eh? I mean from the horse's mouth and all that. <laughs> So with the uh, with the fall of the Roman Empire, was there a pun associated with the Roman Empire, the Holy I Roman don't Empire, think so, no. Scaly Roman Empire? That's the one. That was the pun that was yeah, in the book. Yeah. I remember it oh, now. Yes. Uh, uh, we move on to a, to a next century where uh, uh, we encounter the Vikings, the dinosaur Vikings. Now, ah, I mean, that, how does that even work with the cold right? blood? Were these like warm blooded dinosaurs? I mean, I guess we have evolution at this point. So I was curious about that when we got to this part of the part of the book, uh, uh, because yeah, like, like there have been some warm blood of dinosaurs but uh, we encounter these and they're and they're still doing their sun worship they're still trying to warm themselves in the scant rays of the the sun in the morning but they have compensated for their their lack of uh, uh, endothermic generation mm-hmm. uh, through the technology of their manual labor who are now much more integrated into their right. into their society through uh, handmaids and uh, uh, hand <laughs> servants um, who manufacture for their their dinosaur viking overlords uh, uh, the the supremely technologically advanced furnace armor. Oh, it's like it's it's kind of like yeah, the armor with like a little bit of coal built in. So exactly. Like, I mean, and that's the thing. If you have like uh, mammali- mammalians to like build yourself a fire, you can like get up early in the morning because they just like they say like okay, it's time to wake up the Lord, and then you just like stoke the fire a little higher, and that heat yeah. up the house, and it'll warm them up. And that, I mean, I guess that was what brought down the Roman Empire. The, sorry, the scale and the, the scaly the Roman the Empire. Scaly Roman Empire here. <laughs> yes, so it's the fact that basically they ran out of wood. Yeah, uh, I mean, the original one did that because they, they were uh, chopping it down to make boats and stuff like that i guess in this in, wow. in, in this version of the world's history it was just for like fueling the, the dinosaurs to make them warm Plus in the morning. Change yeah. and history repeating yep. Uh, so this is why the, the the Vikings were so successful in this in this era. They also possessed uh, a technology known as sunstones. Like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah these were special. Oh, hold, yeah, yeah, hold them up against the sky, and if you can, you, yes. it kind of helps you see where the sun is because it. The, I think it's a um, uh, uh, Iceland spar. Oh yes, well I was going to say the effect. I think it's the same as uh, oh, it's the polarizing. Polarization. Yes. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, that's where I was looking for. Uh, you know, there's still there's still a lot of question about how and whether those work. But it it was a technique. Uh, it was a technology unique to the Vikings that mm-hmm. allowed them to uh, identify the position of the sun on overcast days or even after the setting of the sun. Yeah. Uh, which allowed them to navigate with much, much more precision than anyone else could do, which is why they could do these raids. And in addition to that, they had their furnace armor mm. uh, being able to warm themselves up throughout the cold, cold days and practice, like, up until then, Northern European warfare was a 
20 minute a day thing and eventually oh, if like, at all yeah everybody on the battlefield and just sort of Scandinavia, Scandinavia just it wasn't like occupied it's like, yeah. it was just like some some voles and some lemmings I suppose that were living there so this was under the under the reign of Eric the Opalescent uh-huh. ah, which he was like he was a shining example of uh, yes and a, and, a, and a fun little joke for uh, a paleontologist students out there there was a pliosaur, which is cousin to a plesiosaur. It's one of yeah. the uh, it's one of the sea dwelling ones, whose bones had had opalized over time just oh, through mineral nice. absorption. Yeah. So when it was when it was discovered, it was gorgeous, and it was I and can it was, imagine yeah. yeah, it was absolutely beautiful. And for some reason, uh, one of the original discoverers named it after Eric Idle, and ah, it, and this an this sword. skeleton was just. Eric. Oh, it was just Eric. I, yep. I, th- I thought it would be an Idolosaurus, <laughs> who would just right? be like, you know, like uh, just like li- a bit, bit of a layabout, who doesn't really do very much. <laughs> that's it's like it w- all reptiles. It was an Idolosaurus. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, exactly. It's like it's an Idolosaurus. It's just like, yeah, I can't be bothered. I'm just like going to stay, stay in bed today. But yeah, Eric the Opalescent was a, was a, was a famous Technosaurus in ah. this case. Also a real dinosaur, if you can believe that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, and this and like I was I was captivated by this this idea um, of of new technology. I mean, this was as significant to the dinosaur civilization as the industrial age was to us. Like the idea that you could bring your own heat and just wake it yourself fan- up. It was fantastic. Yeah, work in the cold. I mean, you still kind of have to like get one of your uh, hand servants, hand servants, and handmaids. That's yeah, one, yes, to 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 stoke the fires in the morning. But I guess that's how it works. It's like you just kind of wake up when you get warm enough. Yeah. I mean, that's at least I assume that in how it works. They're kind of like always just kind of like snoozing and like at a very low level of uh, activity. And then when, when the heat gets up, they're like, okay, I'm awake now. So, yes, uh, so after we see the, I guess the, the, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, which leads us into the Age of Enlightenment. Oh, what a relief. It is. I mean, like, I mean, Enlightenment's always good. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess we go back a little bit to the uh, uh, the Shinovanator Buddha. Uh, I mean, they were all about Enlightenment. <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. And, like, and abandoning their sun worship in favor of, like, reason and logic, logic. and science. But also the problem of religion. Yeah, uh, and it's like I, th- I thought. I thought it was quite. Uh, as, as a Dutchman, I thought it was quite interesting that this book went to a, uh, a, f- a famous war in the uh, European war, at least from our uh, point of view, mm. the Eighty Year War. Ah, yes, between uh, B- between the Nidoserlands and the Spain and the Spanosaurus. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> where uh, it's like basically, I mean, the, I, be- I believe the Hug- in our history it was the Huguenots and the. Uh, that's it that's a, right. Bit of a pan-European war, actually, for the independence of the, uh, in this case, the Nidoserlands. The uh, Nidoserlands. I, I couldn't quite get what the reference it's was. The I mean, of, it's, it's the name the of it's the name of it's the name of yeah Netherlands and it's the name of a dinosaur. And it's a dinosaur. Kind of, yeah. 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 And the Spani the, the Spanosauruses. I think they even just made that one up. That's hey, they were a creative bunch. Eric Flint and uh, and Ricky yes. Spore. And I mean, you're gonna run. I mean, there, I mean there, there's going to be thousands or hundreds of dino- different dinosaurs known, but eventually oh, you're yeah, going to yeah, run yeah. out of useful names that you can use in a book. Yeah, but that's the, that's the great thing. You can just keep making up new ones. I mean, nowadays, like the, a, a lot of them obviously are being found in China, and they're, and they're yeah. given Chinese names. So we now have a, a huge new lexicon mm. that they can be named after. Yes, and the Fujisaurus, which I believe... In Japan? Japan yeah, Fuku- yeah, or a Fukushimasaurus or something along those lines. Fukushimasaurus doesn't sound like it'd be very popular these days. Well, I mean, they, they have issues with radiation. Funny that. Yeah. It's like, it's like interesting how you watch that if you look at american pop culture regarding radiation it's usually people being turned into super people Superheroes. And heroes yeah and japanese pop culture regarding radiation is like big destructive monsters killing the city you'd almost think they have like different uh, different historical uh, events in their history gosh really yeah but, uh, so so we proceed through the the era of of industry which is i mean honestly it's a it's a lot less destructive than uh, uh, than our history because being handless still at this point in their evolution being entirely dependent on their manual labor yes. has made them a lot more like respectful and uh, they can relate a lot better to the nature around them so the industrial era is not so destructive they can they can control right. their their use of energy much better their pollution is uh, uh, is much more and they've been doing handled. a lot more i mean of, of course like the discovery of oil is uh, the great thing it's like oh, it, yeah, it, it yeah, immediately yeah. starts like now now they can have like 24/7 heating i mean they, they, they still i think they still kind of need to like tone down a little bit to in order to I mean to they still better. need to sleep yeah, everybody exactly. needs to uh, needs to sleep but yeah we uh, we proceed through the uh, through the 
Romantic eras into the 20th century, the uh, uh, the rise of Elvisaurus. Ah, yes. Yeah. Very popular. Wasn't that a Hipposaurus or something before he got his... Uh-huh. Uh, pelv- uh, no, sorry, a Pelvisaurus. A Pelvisaurus. <laughs> Elvisaurus, the Pelvisaurus, that's right. <laughs> And at this point, there have been some movements among the uh, among the primates that have been uh, mammal husbanded right. to acquire some rights of their own. N- not very successfully. I mean, most recently, it's the it's the servant rights movement. Yes, but that is countered by the by the by the sort of well meaning but ultimately quite destructive devour power. Yes, and there, and there, there, there was, of course, the civil war on the other continent about, uh, you know, the rights of hand uh, mates and hand uh, servants. Yeah, uh, yeah, that didn't go as well in this world as it no. did in ours. It's, uh, it's known as the emancipation decimation. Oh, yeah, that set things back for a long time. It did, and, uh, uh, I mean, by the time uh, uh, that, we, that we close this book, when we find ourselves into, the, into what is for us the far future, where this civilization is at its, at its peak, and it reminded me a lot of where they started. They're all living in, in commune cities, like yeah. the, the, the principal energy source is solar power. They've returned to the sun worship. And everything is like, it's a lovely thing. But this 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 seemingly like idyllic situation is still, I mean, they still haven't resolved the fact that they are dependent on, on manual labor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even though that's not a big part of their civilization anymore, the, the, the remaining primate species have have gathered together into, into a bit of a, a resistance known as the Underhand, uh-huh. yeah. yes, who have in secret in their reservations with their clever, clever hands been building a time ship of their own. Yeah, and we close with the with the launch of these chronogarias launching up into into space, uh, uh, firing up their time drive back in time. At which point they they see their target, the asteroid, the and, meteor that they want to they nudge try, back to Earth. So it actually hits them this time. So who knows? Maybe they'll succeed this time. I, oh, I, I thought that was a very beautiful twist at the end of the book. Right? It, it, I mean, it was a little bit sinister, but the whole theme of it was the the the, the more things change, the more they stay the, the same, same. Yes. Which, as I'm looking around on this on this first floor of the library and. I mean, I can see my own footsteps. I can see some of my old costumes discarded. It's clearly trying to trick me into thinking that I haven't moved at all. Yeah. That, that seems to be... And yet you have ascended. We have ascended, and, and yet things are still somewhat the same. Uh, it, it's interesting how the, how the theme of this book reflected yeah. itself in the... Is that what you meant by more advanced books? Exactly. Oh, my God, is this going to happen again? Reading the books affects reality. And Whoa. uh, I mean, time travel has always been possible. In the words of Carl Sagan, one glance at a book and you hear the voice of another person, perhaps someone dead for a thousand years. To read is to travel through time. Whoa. (laughs) That was fantastic. Okay, how are we going to rate this book? How are we even oh. going to rate this book? Because it, it, this this book narrates our lives. It does. Well, let's start with our with our favorite bits. Like I really enjoyed Allosaurus the Great. Yes, he was, and yeah. and his campaign, like it, it, that was fantastic and really spoke to me. And uh, yes, and, and I loved the, the mammal husbandry thing. I thought that was a very <laughs> very good concept to like turn the inner eye on like the th- things we have in our world. A very good social political commentary. I thought so too. Good job. Eric Flint and uh, and Ricky Sporzy. So, um, read. I mean, rate it out of an eon. Okay, and is, and is that one of those Buddhist eons? One of those like birds, like uh, eternity things. There's a big mountain. Once in a thousand years, a bird comes by and sharpens its beak on the mountain, and like eternity is when the mountain is worn down to sand. Wow. Okay, <laughs> so out of that, how are we going to rate this book? Crow. Crow, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, the ultimate, the ultimate Corvid. So, crow out of eternity. Wow, 19, this is okay. Cor- Corvid nineteen out of eternity. Oh god, <laughs> too topical. Okay, too topical. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of reviews, if you look down at your podcasting device, you should see uh, an opportunity to leave a few little stars for for yours truly. We'd love to hear from you uh, what you thought of this week's book. You can get in touch with us at Cover My Ass Cast on Twitter and Cover My Ass Cast at gmail.com. Uh, we'd certainly love to hear from you if you have an idea for a cover uh, for a baffling book that you'd like us to review but not read. But in the meantime, what do we have in store for our readers next week? Uh, next week's book is by Jenny Lawson. It's called Furiously Happy, a funny book about horrible things. Ooh, that about covers it. Thank you for joining us at Cover My Ass, where baffling books are reviewed but not read by yours truly. My name is Kaki. And I'm Kay. And remember, we, we only judge a book by its cover. cover. This book was amazing.
it was, was, it was dinosaurs. like opening, mind opening. And I just love the idea of like dinosaurs walking around with, with technical arms. And, and the invention of the space ball was a very big thing in this world. Yeah, I, I can say, what is the space ball? The little grabber arm that the Apollo astronauts used to take stones from the surface so they didn't have to bend over. The, the space oh, claw. Oh, yeah, that's just a claw that they use in the, in the park to pick yeah, up trash. Exactly. And they put them, that's they're called the space claw. I don't know, that's what I always call it. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine that.